So I think we have uh, one of the highlights, or the one of the highlights today. I have the great pleasure of introducing um, Professor Dario Floriano from uh, EPFL in uh, Switzerland. He is very well known in the field of artificial intelligence robotics, especially biologically inspired robotics. He did a lot of seminal work in the area of artificial evolution, morphogenesis, uh, modeling, and he is also an authority on flying robots, especially biologically inspired flying robots. He also wrote a very well-known uh, textbook on biologically inspired artificial intelligence, which was published by uh, MIT Press. And uh, we are very much uh, looking forward to your presentation. Please listen carefully so that after the presentation you can also ask questions to Professor Floriana from the Global Virtual Lecture Hall. Okay, Dario, thank you very much for coming. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Rolf. Thank you, everybody, for uh, being here. Um, the, um, the talk today or the lecture is going to be an overview of some of the uh, projects that um, I've been carrying out with my students and collaborators over the past uh, seven years or so. It's not a full coverage, but it's just a few examples of how you can take inspiration from nature. And um, instead of copying nature, you can extract principles of operation and translate those principles uh, into solutions that are feasible using um, the technology that uh, is available to us. So you see here this, uh, the screen. This is a little bit uh, a reminder uh, for my collaborators and myself of where we want to go. Uh, we want to develop bio-inspired robots, in this case especially flying robots, that are made of uh, compliant and flexible materials, that have uh, sensors that are very rich and um, uh, can allow these, these systems to fly in the same type of environments where humans live. This could be cities or it could be houses or, or forests, for example. And we want these systems to be autonomous, so to have some artificial intelligence on board, and uh, possibly operate in societies, in teams, not only in collaboration with humans, but also in, um, in collaborations uh, with themselves. Okay, so before flying, another one way of uh, getting in the air is to, is to jump. So imagine that you have a system on the ground and you want to overcome big obstacles. This is a big problem for small robots. So the smaller the robot is, the uh, larger any obstacle, of course, is to the robot. So, uh, and this is the same also for insects. Many insects overcome this problem. Instead of walking around the obstacles or climbing over the obstacles, many insects actually do use jumps uh, to overcome big obstacles. And sometimes they also have wings that uh, deploy in the air to prolong, if you like, to extend the flight into a gliding mode and, uh, um, and, and land down on the ground. So we have been looking with uh, uh, my student Mirka Kovac the possibility of designing a micro robot that is capable of uh, overcoming obstacles that are much uh, larger than, uh, than the robot's body. And what Mirko did is that uh, he came up with a, um, with a micro robot that is only 7.5 grams, including the batteries and uh, um, infrared communication that capture some of the principles of uh, jumping insects. Jumping insects exploit three principles, and uh, um, I'm going to show that to you in a movie uh, as the uh, movie runs. So what I do now is that I switch camera, and I move on to a camera that films my screen. Okay, you should see my screen now. Can you see my screen? Yes. Yes, you can. Yes. yes. Can. yes. And now you should see the video. You see, when the insects jump, what they do is that they do ballistic jumps. It's not very controlled. They release energy very quickly in the environment, and then they fall um, on the ground. Now, what the student did is that he, de he developed a, um, a mechanism so that the, the legs are loaded very slowly, and then, thanks to this small tooth, the, um, the energy of the spring is released very quickly onto the legs. So the first principle of jumping in insects is slow charging of the energy into the legs, storage of the energy, and then fast release of this energy. The second principle 
is <clears throat> the uh, particular mechanism of these legs. You see it's called the four-bar mechanism. One, two, three, and four is here within the body of the insect. So this four-bar four mechanism, which is implemented in all the legs of locusts and fleas and grasshoppers, allows the system to release this energy very robustly without breaking up, basically. The, the robots can jump uh, 27 times its own size. It is still a world record. It's in, for this particular robot, it's 1.4 meters. And, uh, and it can do, with the battery charge, it can do repetitive jumps. It can jump many times. The problem with this robot, you could already see, is that it needs a human to perform the next jump. So the robot can jump from any type of location, but as soon as it has performed the jump, it will typically fall on the back or on the side, and then a human is needed. Um, before we move on to a solution to this problem of uh, uh, jumping again, I want to mention the third principle that insects uh, use in order to jump, and this is the flexible legs. So we said three principles, uh, slow uh, charging of the energy with fast release, the four-bar mechanism to improve the mechanical robustness, and the third principle is the, flex, uh, the, the flexible legs here, so that when the energy is quickly released in the environment, the legs can absorb part of this energy and gradually release uh, through the contact with the ground. And this allows both the insects and our robot to jump from any type or almost any type of ground. This could be a table, like a desktop table, or it could be, for example, a sandy terrain, or it could be uh, grass. Let me now switch back to uh, the camera, pointing uh, to myself, <clears throat> so that you can then see the slides again. Now, the problem is the fall. And when you've seen when insects fall on the ground, what happens is that they have flexible exoskeletons that allows them to be protected and absorb the, uh, the collision, the impact with the ground. So what we decided to do is to provide an exoskeleton to our robot. And uh, in this case, the exoskeleton is, um, is a sphere made of uh, uh, carbon fiber. And we have got an axis on the, um, uh, along the center of the sphere. The robot is fixed, is solid, if you like, with this um, axis on the sphere. And it can slide on, on, uh, on this um, um, on this axis as, the, uh, as it loads the uh, legs. I want to show to you a movie of how this works. Um, the, as you see here, the robot is falling on the ground. The center of mass is such that as the robot loads the legs, the center of mass is such that the robot rolls in the direction where the legs are pointing towards the ground. And as the, um, this cam reaches the point with the teeth, then the robot takes off. Of course, the cage allow, gives additional weight to the robot, so it cannot jump as high as it did before. Uh, in these particular cases, it can jump only 70 centimeters approximately. Um, uh, that is a half than the size without the cage, but this is still a reasonable size for, for um, uh, a reasonable height for a robot of this size. Now, the robot has almost no intelligence. All it does is that it performs multiple jumps, and thanks to the fact that it rolls and it uh, um, uh, hits walls, it sooner or later it will uh, jump in a direction that allows the robot to uh, um, um, jump again in the right direction. But of course, insects also can decide in which direction they jump. And then the questions we asked was, how can we allow this jumping robot to jump up in the air in a, in a desired direction? And we looked again at the way in which insects uh, decide the direction, and we noticed that many jumping insects do not decide the direction while they are gliding or in the jumping mode, in the jumping phase, but they rotate when they are still on the ground, they rotate in the desired direction, and then they perform a jump. And therefore, we modified our robot so that, uh, um, as you can see uh, from the camera here, the robot still has this flexible cage, but this time, along the axis, we have an additional small motor that allows the robot to rotate in this desired direction and then load the energy in the legs and perform a jump. And I want to show to you now a video where you can see this robot in the lab. This is a small window, a small opening, and the robot has to jump up the stairs, always reorient itself so that it is pointing towards the next uh, step, jump up to the next step, and then eventually jump over the uh, window. 
In this particular case, the robot is not autonomous. It is teleported using an infrared uh, uh, remote controller. But it, you can already see that by providing, for example, some sensors of uh, lightness or some vision sensor, one could imagine of extending the uh, device so that it, it is uh, autonomous. Now, I mentioned that many insects, once they are in the air, because of uh, after jumping, they actually... <clears throat> um, um, uh, let me go back to the camera. Uh, let's see. Okay. Many insects, when they are in the air, they uh, then deploy their legs. Oh, so the camera is not yet online. Okay. They deploy... The Okay. They deploy their wings once they are in the air. They deploy their wings, and then they glide down towards the ground. So before developing deployable wings, we decided to see whether wings provide any advantage to a gliding system uh, rather than uh, um, simply jumping and, and falling on the ground. And what we did is that we equipped our jumping robot, as you can see here in the, in the slide, with two fixed wings and um, with a, a small... Um, uh, rudder on the back. The rudder has electromagnetic coils that allow the robot to um, turn in the desired direction, so to steer in the desired direction during the gliding mode. And what we did is that we uh, put this robot, um, we tested the capability of this robot uh, of jumping. First we tested the, the jumping uh, capability of the robot without the wings, and you can see that if it jumps from a height of uh, two meters, it will uh, cover a distance of two meters. So this was a two meter flight. If you give wings to the robot, you see that by jumping, it will extend the uh, length of the jump up to four and a half meter, that is 125% larger. So wings, even if they are not deployable, they do provide an advantage to these uh, flying, to these jumping systems. Here you see the, our jumping and gliding robot, a DPFL. It, um, it jumps, and then it performs most small jumps, and then it glides down. Of course, the glide is not so visible here because the higher, the more elevated the position is, the more the robot can take advantage of gliding. But there is another advantage of having wings, is that we do not need a cage anymore because the wings already provide a sort of stability to the system, to the robot, so that when it um, falls on the ground, it will always fall in a position where the legs are in contact with the ground so that the energy can again be stored and uh, released again. So the next question is, how can we possibly provide uh, deployable wings uh, to this uh, robot? And we took inspiration here from uh, uh, bats. Uh, this is work in progress, I should say. We don't have the entire solution at the end yet. But you see that the bats are very efficient because they can uh, close the wings in the very compact size and then release them uh, uh, very wide open. So we copied, in a sense, this time. We mimicked the uh, mechanism of the wing folding of bats. And we designed um, flexible wings that have um, uh, small ropes cables here, if you like, that can be pulled by a mechanism so that the wings close. Now, when the wings want, are released, also, I should also say that at, the, at each of the joints there is a small spring so that once the ropes are released by a shape memory alloy uh, tooth, they can open in 50 milliseconds. So the idea is that we throw this robot with the closed wings in the air. As the robot detects that it starts to fall, it will deploy in 50 milliseconds the wings and then perform a mild glide. It's not the best glider I've ever seen, but it does some gliding. So the idea in the, in the future, uh, and this is a uh, work in progress, as I mentioned, the idea in the future is to um, um, combine the uh, deployable wings, the mechanism of the deployable wing with this um, end, uh, motor that um, closes the wings, with the same mechanism that loads the energy in the legs. The idea is that as the robot falls in the ground with the open wings, the same uh, motor will close the wings and load the spring that uh, um, charges the energy in the legs, and then it will quickly release the energy to the legs. The robot will jump in the air, and then it will open the wings, deploy the wings, and glide down to the ground. So I'm looking for PhD students to continue this project. So if you are interested in this, just um, uh, a look at uh, the application for doctoral program at EPFL and uh, mention that you're interested in this project. Right. I Let's can, move on now Dario, to the... I can highly recommend your laboratory. I would highly recommend <laughs> Thank your you, laboratory. Thank you, Rolf. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. 
So let's now move on to the next uh, question. That is, imagine that you are now in the air and you, you're flying indoor or in among buildings and you want to avoid incoming obstacles. So if you are very small, one of the largest uh, uh, problems that you have is um, uh, size. Excuse me, if you are very small, one of the largest problems is to have enough energy uh, to fly uh, long enough. So when it comes to sensors, you, we can uh, uh, completely exclude all the active sensors like sonars and infrared because they consume a lot of energy, therefore they require batteries, and also they are quite bulky systems. Now, all insects that are very small, they exploit vision uh, to fly around um, cluttered environments. And so we want to um, mimic, in this particular case, the way in which insects perceive the environment. And the way in which insects perceive the environment is, is very different uh, from the way in which uh, humans do and mammals perceive environments. What you see here is a slice of a brain of the head, if you like, of a fly, house fly, from the top. You're looking from the top. And you see here the, two, the sections of the two eyes. All the, uh, or almost all insects use compound eyes. And the compound eyes are, if you look at, for example, at the left eye here, it's just a collection of small eyes composed of one small lens. And this lens focuses the photons, the um, uh, uh, light rays, down to only five to seven photoreceptors. These five to seven photoreceptors of each eye cannot really form an image. But what happens is that down here in the nervous system of the, of the insects, there are a number of neurons that look at how at the uh, sequential activity activation, if you like, of the photoreceptors across the surface of the compound eye. And what these neurons do, or one of the things that these neurons do, is that they measure the motion of features along the surface of the insect. And there is a very interesting mathematical relation between the magnitude of the translation of a feature on the eye of the insect and the distance of the corresponding feature in the environment. That mathematical relation that has been discovered approximately 30 years ago, 40 years ago by Kondering, says that the faster an object translates on the eye of the insect, the closer that object is in the environment uh, to the insect. So all the insect has to do is to measure how the different features move in the, on the surface of their compound eyes. And as soon as they detect that one feature it moves at the, at the uh, speed that is larger than a certain threshold, the insect has to move in the opposite direction, a little bit like the Breitenberg vehicles. Um, Ralph, did you already cover Breitenberg vehicles? Yes, the, um, we provided some reading materials, so they should be familiar with the concept of Breitenberg vehicles, yes. Excellent, yes. So it's really like a Breitenberg vehicle, a reactive, very reactive system. However, there is a problem here. And the problem is that the uh, mathematical relation of the, um, between the magnitude of the optic flow, so to speak, so the velocity of the transition of the features on the, on the eye of the insect and the distance of the object only holds when the insect flies on a straight trajectory, on a translational flight, we say. We say. In that particular case, as the, if the insect flies on a translational flight, that uh, mathematical relation holds. As soon as the insect rotates, deviates from a translational flight, the optic flow, the velocity of the speed of the features on the compound eye is no longer proportional to the distance. And so the big question, which the neurophysiologists do not know an answer to yet, the big question is how do the insects cope with the rotational optic flow? Because the insects fly, they also turn as they fly around. So we decided to um, make an hypothesis here and, uh, and test it on our flying robot and potentially, eventually, uh, suggest neurophysiologists whether our hypothesis works and perhaps they could also check if it is the case in, uh, in insects. In order to test this hypothesis um, and, and to develop a small flying robot in cluttered environments, Jean-Christophe Souffre, who has been a PhD in my laboratory and then a postdoc, and then recently started a very successful company in uh, flying robotics, which is now uh, um, the largest provider of professional uh, autonomous drones in the world. What Jean-Christophe did is that he developed this 10-gram indoor microflyer, which, uh, which consists of um, two cameras pointing uh, uh, forward and downwards. 
So if you like, we are not interested in the entire field of view. We are interested in the optic flow, in the change in the information along the uh, uh, horizontal plane where the um, robot is, along which the robot is flying. And we are also interested in looking at the ground to avoid obstacles that are on the ground if the robot falls or approaches too quickly the ground. The um, robot also has um, uh, gyroscopes. Uh, within the uh, cameras. And these 3D gyroscopes provide the robot information about the rotation of the robot in space. And we know that insects also have gyroscopes. They are called altiers. They are small fossils of old wings, ancient wings. This is what um, neurophysiology, um, excuse me, it's, um, insect scientists think, insect sci scientists who study insects think. The, these altiers provide insects with the gyroscopic information how they move in space. <clears throat> so what we decided to do uh, with this robot is to, um, whenever the robot flies on a straight trajectory and it encounters a, a, and it detects a feature that moves at the speed higher than the tolerance, a certain tolerated threshold, the robot will rotate in the opposite direction. While the robot rotates in the opposite direction, uh, and this is detected by gyroscopes, the vision system is shut off. And the robot basically flies, turns blindly. Until it stabilizes again, then we switch on the cameras again, and the robot can continue to measure the optic flow as it is moving in a fly, in a straight translational flight. So as you will see in the movie in a moment, this works very nicely. Uh, you will not see the transition so, as, so abruptly because the robot performs micro uh, adjustments of the trajectory so that for the human eyes, this is not so visible. Uh, I just want to mention that there is another thing that insects do, and uh, that is they regulate speed. So how can you possibly regulate speed? So this, by the way, these are the two cameras. One is pointing uh, forward, and one is pointing downwards. And um, uh, we have the gyroscopes. And then the question is, how does the robot, the uh, insects, regulate speed? So uh, for insects, there are two theories. One is that the insect uses the um, uh, visual information <clears throat> to detect how the globally it is moving in the environment. The other theory is that um, uh, insects use um, hairs in the body to detect the airflow and uh, estimate their velocities. Now, what we decided to do is to use the second hypothesis and to use something like a hair. Now, we couldn't possibly put hairs on this robot, so what we decided to do is to use a passive propeller, which is called the anemometer. As the robot flies in a translational flight, this anemometer will start rotating, and we have an optical encoder here on the back, so that which measures the number of rotations per minute, and this gives us an approximate uh, estimation of the speed of the robot. The faster the anemometer turn, the faster the robot flies. And we use a very simple uh, PID controller to regulate the speed of the robot so that we maintain an optimal rotation speed of this anemometer. The, um, I will now go, I'm going to show to you a, me a movie. I will switch camera of this robot flying autonomously in a, in a, in a room. So here we have the rudder and the elevator. Um, okay. Let's skip this for sake of time. This is a control strategy. OK, so you see Jean-Christophe uh, launching the robot. The robot is now fully autonomous. As you can see, it flies very nicely. It avoids the walls. It avoids all the walls. Not only it avoids the wall, but it also avoids the ground. So the same strategy for avoiding the walls is also used by the ventral camera to avoid the ground. So the same algorithm is capable of performing both, um, if you like, obstacle avoidance and altitude control. And this is, a, we think, a very economic uh, solution which evolution could have exploited uh, by simply replicating the same mechanism which is very well known for avoiding obstacles that are encountered by an insect as it flies forward, replicating, making a copy, if you like, of this neuronal system for the uh, photoreceptors or the compound eyes areas pointing towards the ground in order to avoid the, uh, the ground and to maintain altitude. Today, near, uh, the, the scientists who are studying the insects do not exactly know how insects um, uh, regulate their altitude. There are many theories around, and none of them has been uh, firmly confirmed. So our robot, if you like, 
provides an additional hypothesis that could be tested that the same mechanism for obstacle avoidance using optic flow could also be used for regulating flight. Now, the uh, other thing is what happens if you want to fly outdoor? If you fly outdoor, you have ob obstacles, like in cities, for example, you have obstacles that come from all over the place. And you also have, you need cameras that probably are much more, have much higher resolution than our simple cameras as we used in this robot that uh, had many blind spots, so to speak. And so uh, what my other student, Antoine Bayeler, who completed his PhD and is also now a, uh, um, a CTO of the SenseFly spin-off company, what he did is that he generalized this very simple mechanism for um, optic flow detection uh, to any camera, and I don't go into the details here. Uh, you can read the details of these uh, generalized algorithms in one of the papers that I provided for this lecture. But what this algorithm does is that it is applicable to any camera with any type of geometry that is positioned in front of an airplane that has fixed wing. Remember, all this always operates for aircrafts that fly mainly on a translation of flight. It does not work if you, have, if you are using a helicopter or a quadrotor that can continuously rotate in space. Unless you fly the quadrotor in a translation of flight, then yes, it would work. So uh, for <clears throat> if you have a camera pointing forward in any type of aircraft that has fixed wings or a quadrotor or a helicopter that moves mainly on a translation of flight, what Antoine did is that he generalized the algorithm so that you have only two kernels, or if you like, two neurons, that sum up and weight appropriately the optic flow vectors measured in all the directions around the robot. So you take many pixels and you weight the values of, these, uh, of the optic flow detectors and then you sum them up in two kernels, one that controls the pitch or the altitude of the aircraft and the other one that controls the roll, like this, of the aircraft. And any type of aircraft, if you are a pilot, you know that you can steer an aircraft around by controlling always the pitch and the roll. If you want to steer, you will roll in one direction and pitch up, and this will allow you to steer. So here we have now two kernels which operate just like two neurons. They do a weighted sum of their input, and therefore they are very biological plausible. And we test this, um, this algorithm in a small robot a fixed wing robot that has a number of optic flow detectors. In this case, we have uh, uh, four, five optic flow detectors, two pointing on the sides, um, two pointing slightly down on the ground, and one pointing frontally towards the ground. And um, what you see is that the robot flies at a certain altitude, which is the altitude it feels comfortable uh, to avoid the ground. And if it encounters an obstacle, like, for example, a tree, it will avoid the obstacle, continue to fly, and then go down again again, that towards the ground, and avoid the ground using the same obstacle avoidance principle that uh, is used for avoiding um, objects on its uh, path. So this works on, uh, in uh, multiple environments. Uh, as long as there is some texture, the, the robot will be avoiding um, all the obstacles. OK. Now, this takes me to um, perhaps the, uh, let me go back to the camera here to the, one of the last topic I have time to cover today. So at some point, the uh, civil protection in Switzerland approached us, and they, and they asked whether we could develop a flying robot um, that could function, if you like, as a radio bridge between rescuers on the ground in case of a catastrophic event. Now, it turns out that if there is a catastrophic event, uh, and this is true, I believe, in Switzerland, as in Japan, and all over the world, when the rescuers are on the ground, they use a, a dedicated um, a radio frequency to communicate with each other. Uh, because the regular GSM uh, uh, network used by mobile phones, typically in catastrophic events, is either not available because the infrastructure has been damaged, or it is completely overloaded by the call of regular users. So, so the rescuers use a dedicated um, uh, frequency, and in order to use that dedicated frequency, they have to set up um, uh, receivers and emitters around the area of the catastrophic event. And in order to do that, uh, they need uh, trucks that go at the right location, and they, they need dedicated uh, specialists in telecommunication that set up the network and fine-tune.
it. And this takes, the, the civil protection in Switzerland told us, this can take between half an hour and two hours, depending on where the region of the catastrophic event is. So they said it would be really great if we could have the rescuers that go down the ground, they have a box where they take out these small flying robots. The flying robots have um, uh, very tiny receivers, antennas on their wings that can only detect uh, weak signals or at least signals at a very short distance, like 100 meters. And it can emit uh, signals, very weak signals, because the flying robot is very tiny. It does not have enough energy to emit a strong signal. So what these robots could do is that they could fly out uh, in the environment detect the radio signal of the rescuers on the ground and distribute th themselves so that they uh, function if, uh, like a radio bridge to allow multiple users on the ground to communicate with each other. And so um, uh, we um, came up with the... Now, it turned out another thing is that the most difficult thing was not so much uh, keeping the robots with the um, emitter and receiver, not so much developing the... The, the robot itself, which was the fixed wing that you've seen before. But the problem was that uh, we could not use vision systems on these robots because when a catastrophic event happens, uh, typically is night or it, there is rain or there are clouds. So there are all conditions where we cannot use vision reliably. Of course, we could use infrared vision, but infrared vision is very heavy and we would need much larger robots, which are then dangerous if they fall on the ground. So we had to operate without cameras. And the second thing is that uh, the civil protection said it would be good if we also can operate without GPS. So the robots do not know where they are on the ground in absolute term. All they know is that they detect a radio signal and they know if this radio signal comes from another robot or if it comes from a rescuer on the ground. And so the big problem here was to develop an artificial intelligence, if you like, that allows the robot to fly out distribute themselves optimally, detect the rescuers on the ground, and distribute themselves optimally so to establish a reliable radio bridge. And uh, <clears throat> what uh, my former PhD student, Sabine, Sabine Howard, did is that she used artificial evolution to come up with a very simple neural network or um, control system that um, allows these robots to perform uh, this task. What Sabine did, Sabine is now a postdoc at, uh, at MIT. What Sabine did is that she set up a simulation environment, and within the simulation environment, she simulated a, uh, two users, one a rescuer that is launching the robots every 20 seconds approximately, and another user who is located approximately 500 meters away from the first user, and within a, a band, a region of 100 meters. So the robots do not know where that second rescuer is. What you see here, the, each of the MAVs, or micro-aerial vehicles, as they are called, has a communication uh, emission and communication detection of approximately 100 meters on the ground and around themselves. So what uh, Sabine did is that she used these conditions in a simulation. She used artificial evolution to evolve a control system that can locate as soon as possible the two rescuers and uh, stabilize so that they establish a radio bridge. And what I show to you in this, uh, and I have to switch camera one second, <clears throat> camera two. I'm going to show to you the, the video, and I hope you can see it in your, on your screen, of the evolved control system. This is the first rescuer, and this is the second rescuer. This is the communication range of the two rescuers. And what you see there are these red dots, I hope you can see them. They are the flying robots that are being deployed in the air, and they fly, of course, they have fixed wings, so they have, they have to keep rotating in order to fly. And you see that they stretch out until they reach a certain uh, length, which is approximately 500 meters. At that point, they start to fly in a synchronous manner, and they sweep across the entire area where the two rescuer, where the second rescuer could be, until one of the robots at the tip of this uh, swarm detects the radio signal from the ground, and it somehow regulates its flight um, trajectory so that all the other robots then copy it, synchronize with that, so that the entire swarm continues to fly, maintaining a, an excellent radio signal between the two rescuers. Now, 
this, um, um, of course, worked fine in simulation. Then we had to uh, transfer it to, to reality. And there are always gaps between uh, simulation and reality. So what we did is that, and here I don't have time already, I'm over time, is that we um, uh, look at the radio controller, we um, reverse engineered it, and we uh, fine-tuned it so that it fits our flying platform. And what you see here is uh, Severin Leven, another PhD student of mine who developed the hardware. He's launching the robots in the air, and the robots have to locate a rescuer who is positioned in the woods on the background of this, of this video. Um, and what you see, so the, ro the rescuers are somehow here on the ground. And what you see is that the robots are up in the air. These are these uh, small white dots, if you can see them. And then what they do is that they fly in swarm, and they maintain, um, they fly so, so that they maintain radio contact uh, with the rescuer on the ground. When the batteries of the robot is almost about to be exhausted, what they do is that they gradually fly back towards the uh, rescuer that has launched them by simply following the gradient of the radio signal. And thanks to their very um, thin and uh, uh, aerodynamics, what they do is that they simply glide towards the ground and they return to the, to the user. So I had also a few other things to show, but I guess that uh, my time is over. And uh, I, therefore, I want to um, uh, stop here. I'll bring back the camera to myself. And um, I think it's also a good time to, to see if you have uh, any question. I just want to mention perhaps a couple of things. Um, if you want to read more, as Rolf has already mentioned, uh, these are slides that I couldn't have time. Uh, you can um, um, read, find more information about bio-inspired artificial intelligence that you probably already cover a lot in this course in this book by MIT Press that came out in 2008. It also has a website uh, where you can download a lot of slides from all the different chapters and also exercises, software and robotics exercises. And if you want to learn more about flying insects and robots, there is this book by Springer Ferlag in uh, 2009. Thank you very much for your attention. And I'm willing to take questions if it's possible to do so. Well, thank you very much, uh, Dario, for a fascinating presentation. Uh, so I think we have a good idea of what you mean or what we mean by uh, biologically inspired flying robots. And we've also seen that we can extract extremely powerful and often very simple principles from biological systems and apply them to technological systems. So I would now like to uh, open the discussion to the global virtual lecture hall. I think we should take a couple of minutes. We're running over time like almost every week, but it doesn't matter. I think, uh, you know, it's, it's fascinating, it's interesting. And so let's take a few questions to uh, Professor uh, Floriano in uh, Lausanne in Switzerland. Who would like to? Uh, yes, start with a question. Uh, could you repeat? Uh, do you hear me or not? Uh, I'm not sure. Yes, we hear you. Yes. Um, Talking? Yeah, the, uh, there is uh, one problem. I have a, a talk and a job interview, um, which has already started in principle, and I, I should rush out there. So if there is one question, perhaps I, I could take that. <clears throat> I'm sorry about that, but we are a little bit over time. Right. So let's have the question. Is it from, uh, from Moscow? Test of connection. Uh, do you hear me? Yes. 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 yes, very well. Okay, uh, could you repeat why a flying swarm uh, moving toward uh, North Pole uh, in uh, the exactly direction where uh, destination point is located? Uh, so, your question is, <clears throat> if, I, if I understand correctly, your question is uh, how do the robots know the direction where they have to fly? Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Good. So, so evolution, um, the evolutionary algorithm. So when the robots, the control system was evolved in, in simulation, 
the conditions was that the rescuer to be found in the ground is located within a radius of uh, approximately 60 degrees from the launching point. So the robots, as they fly out, they fly in a direction. By the way, I forgot to say the robots have a compass, so they know where the north is. The compass is very noisy because the, uh, also they, they have an electrical motor on board which creates a lot of um, electromagnetic in interference. But the, um, so what the robots know, they know where the north is, and they know that the rescue is within a radius of 60 degrees from the direction where they've been launched. And the strategy that Evolution came up with is that they, they fly out to the um, extreme region to the left. In this case was, you know, to the 30 degrees to the left of the launching point. They deploy maximally, so they extend maximally the swarm. And as soon as they have extended approximately up to a, uh, 700 meters or so, which is what during the evolutionary time uh, was the range where the second rescuer could be, they start sweeping the area in the opposite direction. So they cover, they moved from 30 degrees to the left to all the way to the center and 30 degrees to the right. And during this time, as they do the sweeping, they, they, they will encounter the, uh, the rescuer. Now, this works, uh, assuming that you know, we assume that the rescuer on the ground knows where his colleagues or her colleagues are. So you should know where the, your team is on the ground. What we're doing at the moment, we have a second project. And actually, the job interview is exactly for filling a position within this uh, second project at the moment. Uh, we have a second project where we assume that the rescuers are all around uh, the rescuer who is launching the robots in the air. And, uh, and there, we, however, we also allow ourselves to use GPS. And so if the robots have GPS, then the, uh, the problem is much simpler. OK. Uh, thank thank you, you very much. Yeah. Yep. Thank you for the question. I'm afraid I have to leave. For, for being with us and sharing your ideas on biologically inspired flying robots. So thank you very okay. much. And good luck thank you. Bye-bye, Rolf. See you next bye. week in Zurich. Bye-bye. Bye, Dario. Yes. Very thank you very much for your, for your okay, time. Bye-bye. Thank you for coming. Bye. OK. Now,